We want to thank each and every one of you for joining us. This is a going to be a presentation today on non-technical skills. They're going to, it's going to be on soft skills. And it's part of the Southern District ITE's Leadership Development Program. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We've been having all the sponsorships scroll through the, uh, the share screen image that you've seen in front of you. So I want to thank each and every one of these entities for being a part of the Southern District ITE meeting and for their financial support of the program. Also, I want to encourage you to mute your audio until you have a question, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, uh, and then maybe we'll have some feedback during a couple of different times throughout the, the presentation today as well. I'll also encourage you to please take some notes because we really want to get your feedback and we're going to participate in an uh, in interactive uh, survey there at the end. Actually, we'll have two or three different times that we'll ask you to uh, be, a, be a part of the uh, participation and uh, work through a software called WooClap, which you can use through the web or through your smartphone. Let's see if I've got any other reminder. I think that's it. Let me do this. Also, our session sponsor for, to, for today is CDM Smith, and I want to play this video and want to thank them for their financial contribution to Southern District IT. All right, and with that, let me introduce our speakers for today. Our co-presenters today are first and foremost, Dr. Beverly Langford. She is a clinical assistant professor at the Department of Marketing in the J. Mac Robinson College of Business at Georgia State University. And she's also president of her home firm, LMA Communication, which is a consulting, training, and coaching firm. Uh, Beverly is a, the author of the book, The Etiquette Edge, Modern Manners for Business Success. Beverly has been quoted in lots of publications that are pretty prominent, uh, to mention the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Dealer, and Men's Health, just to name a few. Beverly's active in her community. She's the past chairman of the board of the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce, She's also active in the Atlanta Alumni Association of the University of Mississippi, Adi Toddy. She, is, she received her Bachelor's of Arts from the University of Mississippi, her Master's of Arts from the University of Memphis. I guess it was Memphis State at the time. And then her PhD from Georgia State University. I'll say this about Beverly. She's a friend of Southern District ITE. She developed this course that we're presenting today. She's been a keynote speaker at our Southern District ITE meeting several years ago in Nashville and has helped with various leadership development programs over the years, uh, basically preparing some of these for us that we're using. Uh, partnering with Beverly is Stephen Edwards. He's a licensed professional engineer. Stephen is the transportation planning program manager for the city of Memphis. In his role, he's responsible for planning, design, review, and coordination of all city of Memphis capital improvement projects and grant funded projects to make sure they're in, they're in conformance with the Memphis Complete Streets policy. Uh, he also represents the city at, at the NACTO level, and he's also the liaison for the city with the Memphis Urban Area MPO. He received both his bachelor's and his master's in civil engineering from the University of Memphis, and he occasionally serves as an adjunct professor at his alma mater. Uh, from a Tennessee perspective within ITE, he's our current president, He's on the section strategic planning committee at the Southern District level. He partners with me and the leadership development committee and I thank him for that. And at the international level, he's involved in the ITE urban goods movement standing committee. And then finally, just recently, Stephen received the uh, professional engineer and government award from the Memphis chapter of the Tennessee Society of Professional Engineers. So thank both of our speakers. And with that, Beverly, I'll turn it over to you and let you maybe get us started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you. Let's just think just a little bit about the whole idea of persuasion and leadership. And a lot's being said nowadays about the whole idea of what we call lateral leadership. So it's not so much command and control, but it's getting people on board. As Jay Conger said, persuasion is one of the key elements of lateral leadership. 
There are a lot of competencies that are, are involved in that, but being able to persuade and influence others is key and number one. Now, when we're talking about persuading and influencing, we're not talking about commanding people to do something because we can, because we're in that position. So we're going to be looking at a lot of what persuasion really is. Maybe what you think it is is important, but also what some other people think it is is equally important. Uh, Chris asked you to take some notes and I want you to just jot down as we think about this, the answers to a couple of questions I'm gonna ask you. Number one, who are some individuals or groups whom you have to persuade in your job, in your work? Uh, it may be internal, it may be external, but just jot down someone or a group that you are either currently trying to persuade to do something or you do it on a regular basis. Uh, another thing is, what is it primarily that you want from this audience? What is it that you need from them? And uh, is it going to be easy or difficult to get what you want from them? Very important is what is your relationship with this audience? So think about that. These people you're working with, these people you would like to persuade, what is your relationship? Is it new? Is it non-existent? Is it existent, but not that great? Is it a relationship that you would like to improve? So think about the relationship because as we'll see as we go along, that is critical to being able to persuade. And then finally, when you're trying to persuade them, what are some possible resistances that you may run into? So let's think about these as we go forward. Now let's let's do this. I want to start off with this is our first level of interaction. It should say a QR code and then also a website that you could also use. If you can go ahead and do that. And I want to get some thoughts together related to this topic right here. And bear with me as I change screens here. So let's. Let me, let me, let me start from scratch, guys. Bear with me. All right, there we go. Give you a few minutes just to, to do that. And then what is going on? It's bear with me, guys. I thought I had it ready to go. <laughs> it just malfunctioned on us. Hold on. Hey, well, guys, let's let's skip this first one. I, I, for some reason, it's already fouled up. But I, let's do this. We can go back to the PowerPoint, and let's ask the question right here. Look through these statements. Which of the following statements is false as it relates to persuasion? Think through that. Read through those questions there. Persuasion success may depend on relationships. Number two, persuasion often takes time and multiple conversation or events. Number three, to persuade others, you need to be clear about the outcome that you want. Number four, persuasion is the same as manipulation. Number five, you need to understand the audience's motivations in order to persuade. And then number six, persuasion often requires some compromise. Anybody want to tell us which one you think is false? I hope it's number four. <laughs> You're absolutely exactly. right. Exactly. You get an A plus. Absolutely. But you know, one of the reasons that we looked at this, first of all, all these others are important. You know, it's, it's, uh, it does depend heavily on relationships and it may not be done just all at once. You, you, you may have a fabulous argument, but you may have to have several conversations before it takes place. But a lot of times people will ask me, uh, what's the difference in persuasion and manipulation? And I don't have all the answers, but one of the things that always comes to my mind is that manipulation generally is about what I want. If I want to manipulate someone, it's all about what's gonna benefit me. 
whereas persuasion is going to benefit both of us. It comes from a couple of, I believe, Latin words that mean to sweeten throughout, meaning that if you persuade someone, if you do a good job of persuading someone, they're going to be on board. And so persuasion, as you can see from the slide, may be very overt. It may be, I'm trying to sell you something. I want you to be our client. I want you to approve this project. But it also may be more implicit. It may be as a manager or as a leader, you want people to get on board about a project that may not be even up and running by now. But you as a manager and as a leader, are always persuading people to do things that are going to be beneficial to both parties. So sometimes people will say, okay, well, what's the difference between persuasion and influence? Anybody want to take a, 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 a suggestion of that? What do you think is a big difference between persuasion and influence? Anybody? And remember, you're mute, so you can unmute if you want to answer us. Quiet crowd today. They're looking out the window and seeing that sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I would say persuasion is about um, influencing someone to come alongside with you in a decision and be agreeable to it. Manipulation is about um, sort of twisting them into agreeing, but without their full awareness of what they're agreeing to or um, what your underlying motivations are. Okay, thanks. Hi, Becky, how are you? I'm good, Beverly, how are you doing? <laughs> Fine. And another difference between persuasion, that's a great way to talk about persuasion and, and uh, manipulation, but another difference in persuasion and influence is that influence is less overt. Persuasion is generally intentional. We know what we want to persuade someone to do. We have an objective. Influence just may be the way that you conduct yourself. It may be the way that uh, you uh, deal with your coworkers, the way that you deal with your clients. And because of the way that you do that, they have such a positive reaction that it influences them to do the things that you're hoping that they would do. For example, if you're someone who's a super hard worker, if the job needs doing, if you have to work nights, if you have to work weekends, you do it. The people around you, you may not even realize they're seeing you as a role model, but the people around you are realizing that you're getting things done and your commitment and dedication means something and they're going to emulate that. And you may not even know that you were the cause of their behavior. So that's the biggest difference between persuasion and influence. And that's why we usually talk about them together because they really are side by side and they can happen at the same time. Several thousand years ago, Aristotle said there are three things that happen if you're going to persuade people, three things that have to happen. And one is it starts with you. He called it ethos. It's, of course, where we get our word ethics or, or ethical, but we call it today credibility. You know, do you have the expertise and the relationship with a person to be credible with them? And then he said, you also have to be able to have a believable message that appeals to one's mental capacities. It makes sense, but it also needs to have that emotional capability that makes people feel right about what you're trying to persuade them to do. Let me get moving here, hold on Beverly. So when we change someone's mind, there's some key principles to keep in mind. Because change is, is, whether it's a mental change or whether it's a physical change, uh, whether it's changing jobs, change is never really easy for us. It always creates a bit of discomfort. And so if you think about it, think about that you've got several layers of, of, of beliefs about things. 
And at the very core of your belief is what you grew up with, what your parents taught you, what you learned at an early age. And then that forms our attitudes and our opinions. And so an opinion may not be very, very ingrained. It, it may be really easy to change somebody's opinion. But to change someone's core beliefs, you really need to have a good relationship with them and you need to do the things that are necessary to change it. For example, let's say that you were taught all of your life that punctuality was important, that people needed to be where they said they were going to be on time. And so that shaped your opinions to anybody who wasn't careful about that. Somebody to whom being on time didn't seem to matter, it really affected the way you felt about that person. So if, however, you realize that there were some things going on in that person's job and in that person's life that did not enable that person to always be on time, then that would change your outer attitudes and your, uh, your opinions about it, but it might not change your core beliefs. If you change the core beliefs, it changes everything, but that's much harder to do. So there's some objectives of persuasion. Usually the people you're trying to persuade are either going to be right on board with you, they're gonna be easy. And you want to keep them with that mindset, but sometimes you want them not only to agree with you, but you want them to act. And then you got people who are a little bit neutral. You know, they have questions, they're not sure. You want to crystallize their opinion and then you have people who are either mildly negative or downright hostile. And so we're going to look at a situation where you've got to figure out how to persuade when you may have several opinions or several uh, uh, objectives you've got to fulfill. Stephen, you want to run us through this case study? All right, so uh, we have our first case study for today is uh, one that I think a lot of people on the call may be uh, fairly familiar with. It's a cut through controversy. We have a group of neighbors who are upset about traffic that commuters are causing by cutting through their neighborhood. One activist neighbor, Pauline Duheim, is pushing to close one end of the street and has enlisted some support of the neighbors as well as the city council representative. There have already been a number of meetings and the police and fire department have decided that they need to maximize emergency response time and the, emergency, the public works director has ruled that the street must re remain completely open. Pauline and the other neighbors are refusing this decision. So as a traffic engineer assigned to the case, my role would be to go in and I would try to provide alternatives. Um, for those of you who work in government, I'm sure that you've uh, probably encountered this a number of times. I think we right now in the city of Memphis have four separate cases of this going on in varying degrees. The, you wanna offer alternatives because I'm not very fond of offering up a no as being the reason for something. You want to find what the actual problem is and understand. So the cut throughs, the volume and the speeds are what are relevant. And we would offer up uh, speed cushions, which is our typical traffic calming device in the city of Memphis. If that wasn't going to work based off of the situation, maybe the block facings are smaller, then we would go with traffic calming circles, just neighborhood traffic circles or something of that nature. Uh, you also have more expensive options like chicanes and splitter islands, things of like that, that um, we may not have as typical design options, which would require more public outreach than additional approval by city council and the mayor's office. So at, at this time, they seem unwilling to do this because they are just, they have their hearts set on closing the roadway. And the need is to resolve this in a way that makes the neighbor, neighbors feel heard and also allows that council person to uh, get a win. Uh, so you don't want to get to your budget season and the city council member be upset with you. That typically never goes over very well for your division once they get to that point. 
So you would have to, my recommendation would be to stage a number of meetings and to discuss these options and get the citizens directly involved with the development of the traffic calming program and help them understand how these other areas would be impacted through the trap through the emergency response times but really through the network connectivity and how this would then uh, prevent people from getting through. Does anybody on the call have a um, similar situation or a, a way that they would have dealt with this in the public? Hey, Stephen, I know I'm not a, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not one of the, uh, the folks that are listening, but one of the things I think is important is recognize that there's probably a lot of emotion that's it's coming from Pauline and making sure that even though they may be attacking us, that we be professional and make sure we quote correct material. Because sometimes when the public gets emotional, they will spout off things that are just simply not true. And we, we can't sit up there and grandstand and just beat them into suppression. We really just need to be tactful and respectful and make sure the true facts get out there. That is correct, Chris. And it's, uh, it's always important when you, you enter, especially coming out of college and entering the engineering field or this may be your first time really dealing with the public directly is to remember it's not a competition. You're not out there to win. You're there to serve the public and provide a service. And so the people that are there and passionate about things are far better than the people that sit back on Twitter or whatever else they have and just fuss about things without any actual direct involvement. They're passionate, they're engaged, they want something done and they want an improvement in their neighborhood. It should always be at the front of your mind that that is why they're engaging you and you're there to help serve them. You just gotta figure out a better way to provide the information to them in a way that calms them and makes them and gets them engaged with this different thought process. Yeah, Stephen, we had a, a project not too terribly long ago where, um, like you say, you know, you don't want to be confrontational. <clears throat> and oftentimes, you know, a community group like that wants to be heard and, and they, they actually get a sense of community when they, you know, they galvanize around, you know, a project and um, it, it often becomes something of like a community reunion. So, you know, the way we approached it is we, we did a lot of listening we did a lot of active listening and, and tried to find, you know, the currencies that meant something to them um, and, and how we could better understand their point of view. Uh, and, and, you know, it turned out that, you know, this particular neighborhood was, you know, a, a historic neighborhood and, and they, um, they really put a lot of focus on, on beauty and beautification and landscaping. And so, you know, we were able to solve, you know, the issue by, you know, constructing, you know, traffic calming measures that had an element of beautification for the neighborhood, which really resounded with them. Yeah. And uh, so I think a lot of time it's finding the right currency and not fighting, you know, the group that you're trying to, to persuade or influence, but become part of the flow and understand them better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to, um, when we are approached by public about issues or private, uh, the private sector, about trying to get a project through. I always uh, encourage people to kind of get out of the way and let things progress. And then you, you figure out how to talk about the things to, to encourage it to, to the way that we need it to go because we can't put out something that's not safe or something that doesn't make sense for the, the system and all the citizens in the city. But we want them to, the people that are engaged to feel like they have accomplish something. We don't want them to walk away because years later it will come back up and there will be some other, there will be a stronger voice that would be attached to it. So. Any, you know, any final thoughts maybe? One of the things that, that, that I would like uh, your thoughts on Stephen is, uh, you know, you've already, the argument is already won. You know, the, the police, the fire and the public works have said you can't close the street. And, and so it would, be, it would be real easy just to go in and say, look, we, we've got the authorities say that we can't close it. Here's what we're gonna do instead. And you can just live with it. You wouldn't say it that abruptly, but essentially you've got the right to do that. But then you've got 
Pauline, and she has really put herself out there as the leader of the group. Uh, she's moved here from another area and she sees herself as a little bit of an authority. And even though you've got the right to do that, you could make an enemy for life for, for, for your company or the projects or whatever. So I'd like your thoughts and I'd like anybody else's thoughts. How do you salvage Pauline's ego? How do you make her an ally instead of an adversary who's just been beaten? So yeah. what are some thoughts about how do you deal? Because she, she may be down, but not out. So what do you do about Pauline? Well, first, I would like to state that no matter what an engineer, or, I'm trying to make sure no one's on this as participants watching that it can get me in trouble, but um, engineers, public works directors, fire division heads, uh, we can all say no. And if the city council decides that it needs to be something and that's something the administration needs, there's a good possibility that it may get closed even if we don't believe it should be. Uh, so it's, our decisions are not always a win. So we're always still having to balance the political spectrum of the conversation with the facts. Um, to really get her on my side, I would probably engage her myself uh, separately. I would take her and I would try to get her to develop a, a plan that she would support and that she feels that she can champion and then let her champion that to her neighbors. That way it seems like something that's really her, she owns and that she can take and the, the neighborhood, the community believes it was something that was built in their neighborhood and they have ownership of it directly. And that person has direct involvement with the end result. Uh, it takes away the, the loss um, and kind of uh, moves that into a, a different conversation. That's great. What, what I'd like to hear other people's, what, what would you say to Pauline if you were dealing with Pauline? What would you say? I, I figure out what her currency is. It's, it, you know, it may be that she's got the ego and, and just like Stephen said, figure out what's important to her and make it sound like it was her idea and she made the city compromise. Uh, I, I would go down the compromise route, assuming that that's where she would, you know, would, would, would benefit. One of the great things you said, Stephen, was getting her involved in the solution. So what are some of the solutions that you all would, would uh, suggest? Well, I think, and you know, my, I have mentioned a few of them, like I, I would try it for traffic calming. Uh, most people believe that traffic calming does divert traffic. Um, most of our studies here locally don't really prove that, but we, we can go ahead with the, the typical thought process. Uh, we don't have to, you know, I guess uh, announce that to everybody, but the, um, it also slows people down. We do have evidence that uh, most people travel under 25 miles per hour on streets that we have speed cushions that are spaced effectively. And so we have uh, hundreds of examples here locally that we could show that are in various neighborhoods, low income to very high income neighborhoods that have these devices in place that have up to 20 years of evidence of performing at a high level. Um, you know, getting that type of buy-in is far easier than going with a different device. Now, if they don't like speed cushions because they drive over them somewhere else and they, they have an issue with that, that's when we start going with those other options. Uh, there's, you know, even uh, reducing the curb radius uh, and the curb spacing at intersections through the neighborhood could reduce uh, some of the speeds. So it's, you work through the options, you provide visuals, things that allow her to see that, and then allow her to be part of the presentation back to the neighborhood. If it seems like it's becoming a real um, personal issue for that individual. Right. I, I just saw a couple of great chats. One person's talked about empathy with her and her neighbors. You know, it, it, uh, don't forget that they're the ones that can't get out of the driveways in the morning. And, and somebody used the term empathy and someone else talked about 
making her a part of a maybe a brainstorming session. Do we have any more chats, David, that, that came in while, while we were looking? I know I saw a couple of Thank you, yeah. Uh, like I said, James mentioned uh, Empty's Key, just meant what you've, what you've already mentioned. Uh, and one, one different kind of scenario that occurred, and I just wanted to mention was uh, similar, I had a similar experience with a cut through it was near adjacent to a, a neighborhood adjacent to a hospital. And uh, it, the, the initial complaint came through and it seemed like it was a big deal. You know, people were against it. But as we had public meetings, it was we, we it was obvious that the majority of the neighborhood actually agreed with adding. I think it was pet facilities that were the controversy. So what we did in that instance was essentially provide the, the non-emotional information and let the council member in the neighborhood kind of come to the, the, the conclusion that they did. So we kind of got out of the way in a certain respect in that instance. Yeah. Somebody else uh, on a chat I saw mentioned a, a staged approach, which I thought you know might set well with her as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Hey, try yeah. it out first. I like that as well. Absolutely. Before you build a lot of expensive infrastructure, try it out with some cones or something that's temporary. Okay. Yeah, we we use a lot of what's called tactical urbanism or in, in incremental design here. Uh, where we'll do use paint and planters and things of that nature to really change a streetscape and let people understand that for several years before we start moving curb and gutter and start you know dealing with all the stormwater infrastructure. Great. Okay. Hey, this right. is Greg. Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, just wanted to just comment a little bit on the the empathy empathy piece. I think it's it's something that's not. I guess innate for engineers, right? We we're we're about numbers, we're about yeah. you know equations and facts, and I think it's a lost art, uh, and then more of an art than a science when it comes to this empathy piece. And people, you know, like this Pauline lady, right? They people won't care what you have to say until they know how much you care, and you have to, you just have to. It, it just take, it takes time, and it's not. It's one thing to say, hey, uh, and I think an engineer would do this, right? I want to empathize with you. <laughs> and you would, and by just saying it, you have lost uh, credibility. But I think just demonstrating that, and I think us older engineers would do well really helping our younger engineers understand how important it is to, to, to find a connection, to listen and listen intently, and really demonstrate the empathy empathy versus just kind of checking a box. Right. I saw that Nathan also just did a chat about listening, how important that is. It really is critical to, to being able to make people feel like they're being heard. Absolutely. Yeah. I hope y'all have empathy with me as I continue to figure out this woo clap in the background. <laughs> we do. <laughs> it, it is a, um, you know, the, the getting to know the person uh, we all get so busy and we're always in such a hurry that you have to a lot the time if you sit there and listen and you understand the person spend some time to research the neighborhood know what's going on in that neighborhood maybe there's other things that have happened uh, we have a 311 system for people to call in different issues that way when you go to the conversation you're not just there and you're rattling off like I can I can tell you you know our your average speed after you put in a speed cushion is going to probably be 24 miles per hour with only like two percent of people going above 28 miles per hour that's not really gonna sell someone right so you, you want to be involved in in with that person don't rattle off the numbers um and it's the time um it's something for for this and it's something uh you know as you even back in your workplace, if you allot time for people and listen to them, uh, don't be in a hurry to get to the next thing. People will always respond, uh, usually will typically respond to you at a much higher rate than if you're always trying to get and go and ask them to have something at a specific time. If they want to talk to you, spend the time to listen. Good. Okay. Yep. Well, in lieu of time, let's keep trucking. How's that? A lot of times we think that persuasion is just, you just keep talking to somebody says yes or no. But there actually has been a lot of study about the science of persuasion, but it's also an art. 
And Robert Cialdini has a great book out and he also has an excellent uh, Harvard Business Review article. He says there's six principles of persuasion. And when I take you through them, you're gonna realize that they're everyday things that we all know about and we all deal with. So you use them all the time, but sometimes it's a good idea to be able to formalize them a little bit so that you can use them more intentionally. Number one is the principle of liking. People like those who like them. Obviously not, a, that, that's a no brainer. But the whole idea is that how do you show people that you like them? As somebody said a minute ago, that you care and that you care about them. And there are a couple of ways that you can do that without acting like you're just flattering someone or just trying to get somebody to do what you want. And one is to find real similarities, whether it's sports, whether it's a hobby, whether it's what your children are doing, whether it's some area that of avocation that you're interested in. I can remember one time at Georgia State that I had a colleague that we got along okay, but it wasn't great. We just didn't seem to have a lot in common. And one day I was in her office and I noticed she had a little statue of a bluebird on her desk. And I said, oh, wow, I love bluebirds. I've got bluebird houses, several in my yard. And that it was like, it transformed her. All of a sudden her personality changed. She was so excited about talking about, about bluebirds and what she had done. And it really made a difference in the rest of our meeting and the rest of our conversation, which I thought was noteworthy. It was such a small thing, but it, it talked about the, it, it told me the importance of finding that common ground. One way you do it is you listen and you find out what's important to people. And then the other is that you give people genuine praise and that genuine praise needs to be specific as well. So instead of telling a colleague, oh, you did a great job on that presentation. Why not say something like, I really like the way you answered the question about how to handle the neighborhood with that controversy about people cutting through the yard or cutting through their, their neighborhood, through their street. So the more specific you can be about what you like about somebody so that it doesn't sound like you're just, you're, you're, it's just a cliche that you're just saying, oh, great job, great presentation. We hear that all the time. What is it about it that was great that you can tell them? So the principle of liking, people are gonna be persuaded more easily by people whom they like. As I said, we know that already. The next one is probably one of the most important ones is the principle of reciprocity. You know, and we put a lot of weight on that. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If somebody doesn't reciprocate, well, you know, I helped him out, but he didn't help me when I needed him. Or he didn't, she didn't hold up her end of the bargain. So the whole idea of, of give and take and reciprocity is important. And what Cialdini says you need to do is make sure that you give what you would later like to receive. So if you want people to help you out on a project, is there any way that you can help them out on something they're working on? So if you can give first, then it's very hard for somebody to turn you down. I remember I was at a client's office one time and I asked about the CEO. I said, you know, is he here? And he said, no, he's out on a call. And I said, well, uh, you know, I, I, I was in graduate school with his wife and, and I, I know about him starting this business. And he said, you know, he's the greatest guy because if you need help before you even ask for it, he'll give it to you. If it's waste baskets that need emptying, he'll do it. If we need copies run for something, he said, frankly, I would do anything he ever asked me to do. And that's that principle, not only of liking, but the principle of reciprocity. And then there's social proof, and we've been doing that all our lives. Well, mom, everybody else's mother's letting them go to the concert, or Jane's mother lets her stay out later at night. 
we start that when we're young and we continue it as we get older. You know, you watch commercials where famous people are saying that they use a certain product. That's the principle of social proof. Other people are doing it, so it must be important. I remember once I was in, in, in a downtown Atlanta and a gentleman walked up to me who was collecting money for a family who had had a, 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 a fire. They'd lost their home. And he was just trying to, this was before GoFundMe, so he was trying to help out by gather, get, uh, 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 getting some, some funds for them. And he had a clipboard and the clipboard had some facts about what had happened. But the interesting thing that I noticed about the clipboard was that there were several dollar bills clipped under that clip. Why do you think he had those dollar bills out there? Why didn't he just put them in his pocket? Why do you think he did that? He wanted to show you that other people are doing it. That's exactly right. That's, that's the principle of social proof. And so when other people are doing it, and sometimes it would be as simple as, as a, you know, our competition has started doing this, this, and this. That's the principle of social proof that's pretty powerful. And then the principle of consistency is that if we make our commitments public, if we make our commitments voluntarily, that we're not forced into doing something, that we're gonna stick with it. And it's easier to, for us to avoid, if we can get somebody through that principle, we're going to avoid their being a, a subject to what we call counter persuasion. Oh, I, I liked your idea, but then somebody came along and I liked her idea or his idea better. So think about if you can get people to commit either orally or in writing, you know, something that's going to say, maybe in a meeting, maybe they'll say, yes, I'll help out with that. Then that's the principle of consistency. Why do you think politicians want you to put a sign in their yard or wear their name on a button on your lapel? Why do you think they're doing it? Well, for one thing, they may want you to be advertisement for them. But what's the real reason they want you to wear that button? It, you've made a commitment if you're willing to put the yard in your sign or the sign in your yard. Yeah, That's right. They know that you're not going to change your mind. You have le there's less chance that you'll change your mind when you get to the ballot box if you have shown others that you're committed to that particular person. So that's the principle of, of consistency. And then there's the principle of authority. Do not be afraid to let people know your expertise and the fact that you're good at something. Uh, the, uh, Cialdini tells a great story about a, a hospital out in the southwestern part of the United States. It was a hospital that was primarily to treat stroke victims. And what they were finding was that people were doing a great job about coming back for their follow-up appointments with their doctors, but what they were not doing a great job of was going to physical therapy. This hospital had a fabulous physical therapy program with highly trained physical therapists who really helped people recover amazingly from strokes. And yet people wouldn't keep their appointments or they wouldn't make their appointments. And they, so they hired a consultant. What can we do to get people to realize that physical therapy is as important as taking your medicine and going to see your doctor? And the consultant went and looked around the place and he came up with one suggestion. You can see from the picture what his suggestion was. He said, what you need to do is get your diplomas, get your certifications, get your awards and put them on the wall. And it's amazing. I think he said that, that the attendance at physical therapy went up something like 20% and never went back. When you go to the doctor and you're sitting in the examining room waiting for the doctor to come in, what's on the wall? Certifications, their diplomas, everything that they're, yes. yeah, they're yes. selling themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what they're doing. They're letting you know that they've got the authority 
necessary to persuade you to do what they need you to do to take care of yourself. So don't be afraid. It doesn't, that doesn't mean that you need to go around bragging on yourself all the time. But if you can find ways to let people know about your training, about your expertise, about your experience, about the things that you've done, that's a huge principle that will help persuade others. And then finally, Economics 101, supply and demand. People like to get what they think is a little bit scarce, that maybe they're privy to something. Sometimes it's information that they know something that other people don't know or they know it ahead of time. How many of you have ever gotten an announcement from a store, from a company that you do business with that's having a pre-sale? They're having a sale before the real sale starts so that you can get in there. You've got this special invitation to come into this pre-sale. Who do you think gets those announcements? So just about everyone. Typically. Everybody. Yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. I was pretty sure it was just me. <laughs> a select few, it's right. <laughs> but that's what we think. Wow, you know, I've got this special invitation. I'm going to get in there before everybody else does. So whether it's some uh, discount, whether it's information, a lot of times it's just being in the know before everybody else is. And so scarcity is a huge principle of, 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 of persuasion. So what I wanna ask you is before we move on is which of those principles do you use from time to time or which ones, remember you jotted down people you're trying to persuade, which of those principles do you think might be useful to you? Anybody? I mean, all of them are useful, but which ones can you think in a particular situation you might be able to use? Uh, Beverly, uh, the very first one is the one I default to quite a bit. I figure out what, what people like and we have common interests and find a way to build a relationship and connect there. Okay, good. Anybody else? One, one that I always appreciated the most was... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, reciprocity, just knowing, I think, you know, knowing that you're a boss, you know, thinking back through the, the bosses I liked the most were the ones that I thought would, you know, would take care of, or either had done the things I had done or would be willing to themselves, so. Great, anybody else? Good thoughts. I'm probably more on the liking side myself. Um, I, I tend to want to have some type of uh, personal connection. I, I tend to, you know, keep away from having to use authority directly or uh, things that fear more, feel more like they're scare tactics, something yeah. to, to force somebody to feel a certain way. I would rather them feel comfortable with me and just be genuine and honest and that they build that trust to believe what I'm saying. Right. And, and remember that, that uh, persuasion is not about demanding something. And the principle of authority isn't about bossing somebody around. The principle of authority is about showing, just letting them know that you've done your homework, that you've done the training necessary, that what you're telling them is backed up with all that you've done to get where you are. So it's not something that you shout out. In other words, it's about uh, it's, it's, but, but you're absolutely right. Uh, when you start just saying, you've got to do it because I'm telling you to do it, that's no longer persuasion. That's just, you're absolutely right about that, Stephen. That's command and control. And most people nowadays are having a hard time responding to that. Anybody else? Anybody want to just add in the chats? What are some of the principles that you think that either you use typically or that you think you might be using in some of the things that are facing you. So let's look at, at a little bit more about this matter of influence. A lot of times the persuasion that we're doing is, is we're persuading people over whom we don't have formal authority. And this model came from a great book 
called Influence Without Authority. And they start off by saying that, first of all, assume that anybody is a potential ally. Uh, don't just write off the fact that, oh gosh, I know I'll never convince this person to do anything because there are a lot of ways that you can go about doing that. So let's think about what are some of the ways that you can convince these potential allies to be more than just potential. The first thing is to clarify your own objectives. To get what you want, you need to know what you want. And many times our objectives are, are not as clear as they need to be, even in our own minds. I do some coaching from time to time. And a lot of times somebody that I'm coaching will say, well, I just want to be a better leader or I want to be a better communicator. I need to, uh, I just want to communicate better. Well, that's a big topic. And usually it tells me that person may not be real clear about what they want to happen. I remember one time I was working with a, a manager from a, a large utility company, and he said, you know, what I want to work on is I want to be able to go to a meeting. And he was primarily talking about internal meetings and have people remember that I was there and that I made uh, a contribution. He said, I'm fine one on one with people. But when I go to a large meeting in, in my company, because it's a big company, he said, when I, I feel like the invisible man, I feel like nobody even knows I was there. And that's what I want to work on. Well, that was specific. He knew what he wanted and he knew where he needed to develop. And so anytime you're working on an objective, think it through until you know exactly what you want to accomplish. This meeting with this person, this client, or this meeting with this coworker, what do you want to come out of that meeting with? What do you want to have happened? So if you know exactly that, then the other thing is, what do you want the other person to do? Someone once said that when you're communicating with somebody, they're all asking three implicit questions. They don't even know they're asking them. The first one is, what's this about? What do you think the second one is when you're proposing something? What do you think is the next thing in somebody's mind? How does it affect me? Absolutely. Absolutely. The second one is, how does it affect me? And the third question Remember, they don't know they're asking them, but you need to answer it for them. The third question is, what do you want me to do? So part of your objective is when you're persuading, what is it that you need from the other person? And then what are the currencies that you need to use to persuade? What does currency do for us? What do you use currency for? Buy what you want. Yeah, absolutely. To get what you want. And that's exactly what's going on here is that there are currencies that you use because everybody isn't persuaded or motivated by the same thing. So let's go through these real quickly. There, there, I want you to think that there are four general currencies and you need to decide the person you're trying to persuade, what is the currency that that person needs? Number one, inspiration. Number two is task, position, and relationships. So we'll go through these real quickly. Inspiration-related currencies. This is the person who's going to be motivated by the idea that what they're doing is for the greater good, that it's the right thing to do, it's the ethical thing to do, it's excellent, and it's going to make a big difference to other people. So as you're taking notes, think about anybody in your world who might respond to the inspiration related currencies. The next one is task related, a lot more pragmatic than inspiration. This is the person who's going to be, this is where the principle of reciprocity comes in. This person is going to be persuaded by feeling like you can help them do their job better. Maybe they need resources. Maybe they need more organizational support. Uh, maybe they need the opportunity to learn something. 
So if you can use that currency, well, you know, I need you while we're working on this project, I want to make it a, this available to you. That can be a huge currency to convince people. Some people like recognition. They want people in high places to realize that they're part of your project and, and they want to be in the spotlight a little bit. If any of you have taken personality assessments, you probably know that some people like to shine. They like public recognition and that's fine. And so those people, if you can figure out a way to make sure that they get some credit and that they uh, get to show off some of their abilities, it'll be much easier to, to persuade them. And some people just might want a relationship with you, just want to feel that you work well together, that, that you understand them, that you have empathy for them, that you know what their needs are, and that if they need someone to back them up or to give them personal support, that you're going to be somebody who's going to do that. And so all of those currencies, they're all different, but jot down the ones you think you would need. So very quickly, which currency do you think you use the most? Anybody? And we've got to an answer <clears throat> acceptance and inclusion coming from the chat box. Yes, right. Perfect. Excellent. Yes, that's and that's a biggie that really will help people get on board. Mm -hmm. And so also think about maybe what are some of these currencies I'm not using that maybe I could use in the future. So jot that down as well. And someone else that said understanding. That's yes, the, they almost <laughs> use most often. That's great. The relationship, the personal support. And speaking of relationships, think about the relationship with the people you're trying to uh, convince or persuade. Is it positive, negative, or, or neutral? And how does that person like to relate? Something as simple as how that person likes to communicate with you. Does that person like to use text or that person rather talk on the phone? Does that person want to use emails or does that person want to try to, obviously it doesn't happen much right now, but does that person prefer a face-to-face? -face? What personal style of communication does the person prefer? Because a lot of times the context and the surroundings can make a huge difference in the ability to, to, uh, to communicate. So after you've figured out all these things, how do you get people's attention? Well, there are a lot of ways to get people's attention, sometime with, with stimuli. I mean, we, we've got, for example, Chris did a great job with graphics on these slides, and that gets your attention. Sometimes it's visual. Sometimes it's the words you use, the choices that you make. Uh, Sometimes it's giving the person something to do. We're all different kinds of learners or different combinations of learners. So how do you get somebody's attention? Do you get people's attention with uh, something that shocks them or something that excites them and makes them feel like things are gonna be great? Because there are two ways to motivate people. I and mean, this is very broad. Obviously these are, are, are at the very top of the umbrella, but as human beings, we're motivated by fear and greed. I mean, we don't call it that, but it's primarily we either want something that we think will be good for us, or we want to avoid something that we think will be bad for us. And so that way you can sometimes use both of those to convince your audience to come on board about something that you're suggesting. So there are affirmative connections, which means if you do this, these are all the great things that are gonna happen for you and for your company. And so then on the other hand, there are the negative connections, which we sometimes call that the fear appeal. If you don't tend to this issue, if we don't work and move forward with this, here's some of the not so good things that can happen. And a lot of times you can use both. Here are the, here are the benefits, here are the consequences. But if you've got a lot of credibility with the audience, you can figure that that fear appeal may carry some weight. You know, we all want to avoid the bad things.
the more credibility you have, the more that people are going to be moved by the negative uh, connection. And also, if they feel that it's going to affect a broader group of people, either their families or their employees or whatever, sometimes they're more moved by that than if it were just about them. Terry Pierce in his book, Leading Out Loud, says that there are two ways that you must use both of to convince people. And the first one we talked about goes all the way back to Aristotle, that you know, you, you, I, I know we talked about that you can't just throw numbers at people, but people also like to feel that you can back up what you're saying or what you're trying to convince them with, particularly if you can take the specific data and put it in the audience's world. Think back about our case study. If you can let her know that slowing the, the, the traffic speed by X number of miles per hour can make this much difference to the neighborhood and its accessibility and may keep this many people from driving on the street. So put the data in their world and if you've got authorities to quote, you can say who that authority was. It may have been, my first boss always told me whatever. It doesn't have to be a famous person to be an authority. And then the next is how do you win people's hearts? Because most of our decisions are generally made on how we feel about things. We don't realize it, but a lot of times that's what it is. And one of the best ways that you can reach other people is to share your own experiences because nobody can disagree with that. If you say, you know, this happened to me several years ago and realize that people love stories. And from the time we were tiny, we love to hear stories. And there's a lot being written now about the power of storytelling in business because it can take a story that will make all the numbers come together in a more understandable way. We can also do comparisons that, you know, trying to get everybody together is like herding cats. We hear that all the time. So it's a matter of using analogies or metaphors just to connect the, own, the known to the unknown. And so after you've motivated, you've still got to move your audience to action. And even if they believe you, they may still delay if you don't make them feel a sense of urgency and explain ex precisely how they're going to achieve their results. So a couple of other ways to channel your audience and one that's very important that Stephen's gonna talk about now is to understand when you've done all these things right, to understand why people might resist. Because I know it sounds great to say, oh, okay, there are these six principles, let's do them and you're gonna persuade people. We all know that that's not the way the real world works. And so what happens when you get pushback, Stephen? So what causes resistance? I'm sure none of us ever deal with resistance, right? On our day-to-day -day yeah, right. lives. <laughs> so, pretty sure everybody that knows me on this call knows I'm usually the, the source of resistance for a lot of things. But. <laughs> so uh, resistance occurs for many reasons. You may not have a strong relationship with the person or that person may not like you or trust you. They may not feel that the need what you present they fit, may not feel that they need what you are proposing, or they may not need it at this time. Maybe later is a form of resistance. And that's something that everybody should uh, keep in mind is that uh, non-confrontational individuals will use maybe later, and it's really a no. So as you gain understanding of the person you're speaking with, understanding when they say maybe later that you need to dive into that maybe figuring out a smart way to dive into it, but figure out what the real reason is for the resistance and not just allow them to kick it down the road, hoping that you will one day forget and never come back and ask them again. They may associate a cost to your proposal and it's not necessarily money. It may seem too much trouble or it may require additional resources. It may require a change in the familiar or comfortable. 
So time and effort are obvious cost to things. And you also have the people that are ingrained in the way that we've always done it. So they don't want it to change because that's not what we do. That's not how we do that here. That's not what we do over this way. So those are typical forms of resistance. Stephen, uh, delay seems to be a Southern way of saying no sometimes. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just kind of like how we draw out our sentences. I may get into a, a nice soliloquy and talk about something off topic for another 30 to 40 minutes and just hope that person has now left that topic altogether and never wants to approach me about it again. Yep, yep. That's, that, that's that whole talking until you convince them. I'm actually really good at that portion. <laughs> So the strategies for dealing with resistance. One of the best ways to overcome resistance is to get out in front of it. If you know some of the reasons that someone may resist your message, acknowledge the issues and address it. If you know for sure that the audience is aware of the opposing position, put it on the table and if possible, refute it. And at times, the audience may have a hidden agenda. So they may appear to resist the overall proposal, but you, they, they may be resisting for other reasons, but the issue itself. So an example of this is when you're uh, starting a new uh, software program or any type of new policy where people push back, they don't wanna shift in the, their behaviors. Uh, several years back, we rolled out a new GIS uh, traffic uh, sign uh, system for work orders and tracking all of our assets. And it, it took quite some time for the field crews to get adapted to that. Uh, there were some technical issues, which don't help. So anytime that you do roll out a, a technical program with people that may resist, try to make sure it's all working really well before you offer it up to them. But um, there's also just the, they were so used to writing it on paper and wanted to continue doing it the same way. So they're trying to find reasons to uh, make it not seem as efficient. Um, some of the other things that you need to remember about resistance is you'll have different audiences. So when you're dealing with one specific subject, you may have your internal people, you may have your boss, you may, in my case, have uh, the political uh, in entities that you're dealing with. You have the public, so you have different groups that you're trying to persuade, and those the resistance will be different based off the audience. The resistance will also vary based off the venue. So if you're standing in the middle of, um, say, a, a certain group that's very fond of environmental issues and you're talking about something, some of them may be far more energized in a large group than if you took them and spoke to them one-on-one -on -one and broke the groups into smaller areas. So you can change the venue and that changes the, the resistance in the actual conversation that you're having. Whereas like in a large group setting, you may get into long speeches and people that are, are really trying to get attention and trying to win points with their friends other than actually trying to speak to you about the issue. So. You ready for the next one, Stephen? I, I am, sir. Oh. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna try this again, guys. I, I think I figured out what happened the first time. Let's hope. So there's your QR code. I'll do it with you. If this doesn't work, I'm just, I'm just, you're just gonna have to just well, we're going to see if it'll work. How's that? So far, so good on my end. Okay. I'll hold you All accountable. Right. <laughs> I can see All it right, on so, my end as well. All right. Let me bring over the... So here is where I got lost last time. So let me... What I'm struggling with is why are we not saying... There we go. There we go. So which reasons for resistance do you most frequently encounter? And there's basically seven options that are here, and we'll give a few minutes. The person doesn't know you too well. You and the audience have had a somewhat adversarial relationship in the past. The person doesn't trust you or your organization. Cost is a problem with what you're proposing. Could be dollars, time, or effort. The audience has a different preference or agenda. Number six, the audience doesn't fully understand what you're proposing and won't admit it. In other words, they just don't get it. Or number seven, the audience either doesn't want to compromise or feels that you aren't willing to compromise. It looks like our uh, 
number six. <laughs> Folks have a different agenda. Yeah. <laughs> Both in engineering and politics, we see that a lot these days, don't we? <laughs> I would say it seems extremely rare to come into a situation now that people don't already have an organized like uh, objective as to what they're wanting to see from any item. It's one of those uh, pre-planning things that you need to focus on when you're, you're setting up a project, start identifying all the possible issues at the beginning and develop a plan of action to communicate and to to try to mitigate possible issues. That way, when you get into these conversations, you have answers for the questions that are coming at you. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, well, we're doing pretty good on time, uh, but thank you. I'm glad we got this to work this time. I truly don't know what happened last time, but it just was not cooperating with me. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. Are you want to tee this one up, Stephen? We'll get started. Sure thing. I guess it's everybody's favorite thing. Um, we can make jokes about engineers and role playing. I think uh, you know most of us might have liked you know Dungeons and Dragons or something of that nature as young children. So, or maybe even now, I'm, I may or may not have Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> books somewhere on the shelves behind me. But um, this uh, this role play today is going to be. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Chris, played by Chris. And Ken, that's played by David. David actually went out of his way to have a different name. And Chris, <laughs> we had no hope in him actually remembering anything other than his own name. <laughs> so they, they are with a metro engineering firm that is looking at, uh, that has been hired for middle of nowhere state universities. Large is a transportation master plan for the large state university in a small city. To sit the study, they need to hear from a variety of stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, administration, laws, law enforcement, townspeople, and visitors to the university. And Chris has identified Ken, his young engineer, uh, for this position to go into town and collect the information. Chris, would you like to start off with your conversation, sir? Yeah. Hey, Ken, man, I'm glad you could stop by. I'm uh, super excited about this project, and I know I've sent it to you in an email, some of the particulars, mm -hmm. but very much want to uh, just sort of start game planning. I mean, I, I see you as the primary guy helping me on this and mm -hmm. just want to get your initial thoughts on the project. Well, I get, yeah, I'd like, I, you did. You sent me the email. Um, I looked through it, read through it, kind of got an idea. What, the thing I'm coming up against, just, and I don't mean to cause any issues, just straight up, is, is, this looks like it's in Nowheresville at the university. I you know, obviously that that was in the email, but it looks like the type of or the amount of work is going to require me to be there for a while. You know, so part of the issue is just being so far away. I, is that I mean, it's not really something I had planned on. You know, with this this kind of career, this type of work, I just that's I'm struggling with that right now. So I, I don't know. You know, I'm not as excited as maybe maybe you'd hope. At least the, the what I can right. gather email. Well, I mean, you can you you know I'm from middle of nowhere. You know, I, I grew oh, up there. I, I did my no. first two years of undergrad there mm -hmm. before I transferred yeah. to, to great, Metro. Great Virginia. place. I know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And my parents still live there. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. two and a half hours away, but it's not that boring. I mean, there's a state university there. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, I, I would say you know, that two and a half hour drive, think of it this way. You could do lots of multitasking in two and a half hours. Yeah. Me, I'd be listening to sports talk. You can get some podcasts, maybe even knock out a few conference calls along the way. So hmm. I, location's not that bad. It's, it's not that far away from Metroville. I don't know. I mean, looking at the type of work it is, it looks like there's going to be a lot, a lot of work. So I, I, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm big in, as you know, Frisbee, ultimate team, Frisbee, city, city chance yep. three tomorrow. So, you know, yep. Yep. really want to focus on that in my, my free time during the week. Uh, Wednesdays. Like to count the cars at the intersection out front of my house. Really, really rely on that every week. Uh, so I don't know. You know that that kind of, the schedule worries me. I mean, is there anything, anything we can do on that? I, I just like I, I see going there. I'm gonna am I, am I gonna have to stay there all week? You know, every week for how many ever months or weeks that it that it takes to to get this done? Yeah, yeah I hear what you're saying, Ken. I, I'll say this. I'm like you, I believe in work-life balance. I think that's important. Yes, it's a two and a half hour drive away, 
so I'm getting lunch with the university president next week, and he's a personal friend. We grew up together. Why, why don't cool. you come with me, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll talk a little bit about schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm certainly willing to compromise on schedule. Uh, you know, I obviously things you're doing at night are important. If you could work a little bit with me on schedule, we can probably get with the university president and mm -hmm. see if we can maybe, I mean, the project's gonna have a good bit of stakeholder interaction, but there's ways that we can maybe straddle it around when you need to be in town as mm -hmm. it relates to, uh, to, you know, I know Frisbee's important for you, so I definitely don't want to, to Absolutely, lose. yeah. Yeah, City Champs, that's pretty impressive, but yeah. Well, I, I appreciate I would, that. I would work with you on, on, on that, absolutely. Okay, well, I do, I really appreciate that. I know you mentioned the type of work too that, you know, you know, I've been an engineer for a few years and I really like the engineering work, you know, but it looks like there's going to be a lot of maybe more sort of planning type work, a lot of interaction with I mean, the stakeholders will be a lot of people interaction. And, you know, I mean, I count cars for for fun on my free time. So understandable. Yeah. I think so. What uh, I mean, is that is that something I have to do or is that really something that I you know? Is there other any other, you know, more kind of square work that you can give me that maybe I could I feel like I could be better at? I don't know that just. All the planning stuff, it's not something I've, I've, I thought I would be doing at the state of life. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I'll say this. I mean, you, you know, it's consulting. So mm -hmm. we always don't control the work, the type of work that we're going to get. Uh, and we like to go where the work is. And, you know, I've got that strong relationship with the university president. Uh, I, I will say this. You've got the opportunity to, uh, to lead to some design work. I mean, some, you know, hardcore traffic engineering, I get it. That's your thing. The touchy-feely planning doesn't seem to be something you're, you enjoy, but keep in mind that if we do a good job on this, that it could lead to the implementation of some of that work that's actually, you know, traffic engineering design. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be honest. I mean, it would not hurt you to blossom a little bit and, in, and increase your expertise in the transportation planning realm i think that will certainly help you in your career to be more well-rounded okay well i mean like that that makes sense i guess yeah but, well i mean you know it's not something i definitely I, I really i'm still not terribly excited about it you know so i think this is something i can do probably get it done pretty quickly and then kind of move on to that next phase that you, you mentioned that 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 sounds something like like something i'd be really excited about so kind of get in there get it done and, and get it over with I think that's what, you know, that's kind of where I see, see myself at this point. Okay. And Ken, I, I'll say this. Um, I've had to work mm -hmm. on projects throughout my career that aren't mm -hmm. the most sexy or the coolest, and this may not be the one. But when you say get it done fast, I want to make sure we understand that absolutely, that we get it done faster, that means we're more profitable. But I don't want that to be at the expense of us not doing a quality job. And I'll even throw this out. You know, we've got some other young analysts in our group that are, that are more quote unquote transportation planning focused. And if it makes more sense to get some of them involved to help you along the way, uh, mm -hmm. we could certainly do that. But you know, I'll say this, I want you to do a good job on this because you know, promotion to shareholders, the next, you know, that's around the corner for you. And I'd love to be mm -hmm. able to promote you out of our group, but with the other senior partners, how well you do on this job is going to probably have a lot to do with that because even though that university president is way out in the middle of nowheresville he has great relationships at state government here in metroville and if we do well on this it provides mm -hmm. opportunities for us to do work in other parts of the state so I, I guess my pitch to you would be yes i'm all about doing it fast but let's make sure that we do it well and go in with the attitude of hey i'm going to make lemonade out of lemons could we maybe come to a, an agreement there possibly uh you know, I, I think that makes sense. I appreciate you being so cool. understanding. I'm telling you, you're going to love middle of nowhere, Nowheresville. they got the best <laughs> barbecue joint in town. Trust me, you're going to love it. All right. All right. So, folks, Scene. what do you what do you think? What what, what do you think? <laughs> the uh, What was the what was the angle from both folks? I'd love to hear some thoughts on maybe some of the stuff that we talked about. And maybe where did you see some of that come to fruition? Chat box is available as well. Toward, towards the end, you did use uh, that there's other transportation, more transportation planning focused um, staff members that you could have help him, which right. could encourage him to understand that this is something that's for his career, that he's in a competition for future growth. 
It's a little bit of fear, it's a fear and bit of fear, and... but it's uh, yeah. Huh? It was well veiled. Okay. <laughs> You did a, you did a, a great job of, of inserting the fear factor just a little bit. So it wasn't yeah. noticeable, but it was, you know, the, in other words, the consequences of, of not doing it. So, yeah. but you focused on the good stuff. I think what was really interesting was that it, along with the fear <laughs> was also a picture that was painted about the bigger picture. Right, mm -hmm. that this is this could be a stepping stone for you, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And so, you know, you 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 can, man. If you if you do this, even though it seems like this is just the the most mundane of projects, I think the bigger picture thing is awesome. And I think that's what a, a lot of us older engineers need to to do a lot of times is to paint bigger pictures versus just trying to get something out the door. Uh, you know, to connect the dots that way. But yeah, the bigger picture was really, I think to me, it was the most convincing of all of the, you know, the fear factor. <laughs> and Chris, I, I thought you did a good job of seeking to understand what the hesitancy was and saying, okay, this is, this is your priority. So let's figure out how to work around that priority. Let's talk to the client. Let's make it work for everybody. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, James in the chat box says, Chris, as the boss, was very understanding and compromising to the lower level engineer. Not sure I'd talk to my boss that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it was meant to be a little exaggerated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's when we first read this. I was like, I don't know. I, it's too like, uncomfortable just having this response. So. Yeah, well, some people would say if I talked to my boss that way, they'd ask me to go find my success somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We need to probably put a disclaimer. Don't don't try this at home or don't try yeah. to yeah. exactly. your real job. <laughs> I thought y'all did a great job. Um, I, I was listening. I may have missed it. But I was listening for a tactic that I've, I've used before with success when it's an honest um, thing is the appeal to ego why did you pick him for this assignment to begin yeah. with? What did he, what does he bring to the table that makes him a good choice? Sometimes that's a good way to help people own a new task. Yeah, I, you're right. We didn't hit on that. We, I, I didn't really puff him up at the beginning of how he'd be such a great person for the job. Uh, I was so busy trying to make sure that I made Nowheresville sound important. <laughs> Maybe he's not so great. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to find something for him to do before you kick him out the door. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I want to respect your time. So we're going to keep trucking. Okay. But that was fun. Appreciate the input. We'll get back over here. All right. Persuasion pitfalls. Just very quickly, because I know I, I, I want to be able to get to your to your nuggets, Chris. Uh, Jay Conger, in his book on the, uh, his article on the necessary art of persuasion, says, uh, "Don't attempt to make your your case with just one hard sell, and at the same time realize that uh, you're going to have to compromise in a lot of cases." I think there was a good example of that. That there was some compromising that went on, and don't think that it's just presenting great arguments. Uh, you can present great arguments, but they may not stick. So it's so much about relationships. It's not a one-shot effort. It's about relationships uh, and it's about negotiating and compromising. So to just to help you remember some of these things is remember to get what you want, you need to know exactly what you want, how you're gonna trade, what per currencies are you gonna use, uh, and how can you overcome resistance with cooperation and involvement and empathy? Uh, and remember that persuasion always takes into consideration the needs of the other person or the other people. And watch the game films. You can learn from each encounter. Anytime you have a, an, a, a conversation, you know, what went well, what could I do a little bit better? So what are your benefits? Well, you get what you want in a lot of cases and you build a strong reputation. You, you enhance your credibility. And, but the main thing is that when you persuade, you make a, a positive difference. 
in uh, your life and in the lives of others and in the lives of the organizations and in the new workplace, which is changing rapidly, that is, it's a faster pace, it's more diverse, uh, it's flatter in a lot of cases, you're going to succeed in this new workplace if you put some of these into practice. All right, folks, as we close up today, I'm going to I'm going to revert back to my first boss in the business back with Kimley Horn in Virginia Beach. At my first training session, he, he pulled me aside. and He says, Chris, you're going to get a lot of information thrown at you at this meeting and you're not going to remember all of it. So my advice to you is to take a few nuggets, figure out which ones you need to take back with you to your workplace. Maybe what are the two or three best takeaways that you heard during this module? And what are some action items, maybe some things that you may need to change as you interact internally or externally, politically or in the community or with your own staff within your own organization. And then, you know, how do you apply some of those techniques into your current role? And then let's finish with one last wordle. All righty. So if you haven't seen this, we're going to do this one more time. And I'll leave this up for just a few minutes for a few people to, to pick the QR code. And let's try this one more time. That's the wrong one. This one. So let's go to our next question. All right, what is the most applicable takeaway or nugget that you can apply in your workplace? And we'll try to create us a wordle that'll come about. And flip it over to the wordle. I don't have any votes just yet. Hey, there we go. Someone wants to listen. Currency ID. Be specific. Empathy. Sometimes be empathetic for the person trying to run the word. Woo clap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Strive to understand. Know your audience. Relationship building. Good stuff. Reciprocate, similarities, empathy continues to, uh, to be higher on our list. That Pauline story resonated. <laughs> cool. Those are great answers. Absolutely. Well, guys, I, I don't, I, I didn't see how many total. I want to say we, I want to say we had it for 48 folks at one point in time. Sincerely got, appreciate. It's, it your, says 58 on the participants. Yeah, 58. It was, right. it was up at 64 at one point. So. Wow. 57, okay. I think was the highest. And okay. then one, one last uh, entry. It says, uh, "Great, now I want Chick Fil A." <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's what nice, I was going to nice. mention. Chris, you should reach out to Chick-fil-A and see if we can get some uh, advertising dollars from them since we have <laughs> encouraged sponsors, people to Absolutely. go eat. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you. Get outside the rest of the day. It's a beautiful day. We appreciate your input. Uh, we appreciate your attentiveness and your participation. I'll close again with thanking CDM Smith. They're our session sponsor. And encourage you guys to uh, look at the agenda and hop on some calls tomorrow for my presenters and facilitators. Thank you very much. Outside of the one mishap, this went well. I do appreciate it.